that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness, rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, it's great to see everybody here, even if it is hot outside, or maybe that's the reason why you're here. It's not hot in here, so... uh, but this is a good thing to be able to worship God. I'm excited about next week because next week we are going to have Chuck who is going to be installed as an elder here. Uh, I'm excited about that. That's going to be a great thing. Uh, thank you, Justin, for leading the songs. Uh, you realize that uh, you're doing a great job with it, but you have to lead people like me. So I think that might be where the breakdown comes sometimes. But uh, you guys sounded great this time. For a first time on those songs, that's really good. Uh, it's always good to be able to learn new songs and new ways to be able to praise. And so that's, that's been a great thing for us. And uh, new ways to praise is always something amazing. All right, so we've been talking about abundance for a while. And uh, this is the last one in that series of things on abundance. So... The first one was just about increase and the fact that we do have a God of increase. And the second one we talked about from increase to abundance because that's what he talks about is abundance, but not just having abundant stuff that you have to insure and store, but about having abundant life. And so he talks about bigger life and bigger things that you do with that. And so that's one of the things that he describes is this abundant, fruitful life, and the secret of being content. The third one we talked about, from small to great, that's where it begins. God always starts small, and it gets bigger, and it goes to great things, and that's really what God's plan is. And so if we wanted to get discouraged about the fact that it's not big already, well, you don't understand. God's plan is wherever you are now is small, and it's going to get bigger. It's going to get greater. It's going to have more abundance. And so that's one of the principles that God has. And then we started talking about abundant grace, the fact that God has saved us, the fact that Jesus paid the price for us, But it's not just a matter of him doing that and no response from us. Because after all, he took Barabbas' place. But Barabbas didn't have any grace. But when he took Paul's place, Paul got great grace. And to the point he said, this is who I am because of Jesus. And then we talked about abundant family that comes out of those relationships and out of that blessing to Abraham, that because he was a man of faith and God promised to bring someone that would bless all nations from his descendant, then we as people of faith are able to get that blessing. What a great thing that is. And today we want to talk about abundant love. And so let's see if we can't describe a little bit. This topic is just so big, it's it's huge. How do you talk about the love of God But uh, I thought we would start with maybe the most familiar passage in the Bible that everyone starts with, and that's uh, John 3.16. And so, I'm a slide or two behind, aren't I? John 3.16 is the one that everybody knows. In fact, to the point where you don't even have to quote the verse anymore. All you have to do is write it on a poster board and hold it up in a football game, and everybody knows what you're talking about, right? I mean, we do that. We assume everybody's going to know that. And so this talks about God loving the world and not wanting us to be lost, and that that's the reason why Jesus came and God gave his son so that we would not perish. 
Certainly God loves the world. He did not send. But we don't know verse 17. See, we get 16, but we don't know what verse 17 or the rest of them down to 21. Have you heard of things called paragraphs? You know, we have an idea in one paragraph, but we want to lift one sentence out of the first and that's all it means? No, it's the whole paragraph, and so you have to take it all together. But it's still a a tremendous paragraph as you look at what's been read to us. God did not send his son to condemn us. He sent his son so that the world could be saved. He didn't send us so that we wouldn't condemn anybody either, just by the way. But God wanted the world to be saved and saved through Jesus specifically. And that's what this passage is. God sent his only son. That's who he sent. He did not send somebody else. He did not make it another way. He did not want us to be saved by another way. We are not saved by our education. We are not saved by our social reform. It doesn't matter how nice people get. That is not God's way. He says, I came and I sent my son to save you. And it's only through Jesus. And that's what verse 16 talks about. It is through the the blood of Jesus. And it talks about whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What a tremendous verse this is so that we realize that we are not condemned. We are able to have this great life because we believe in him and the people who believe in him are are people who have seen this great love that God has and they understand this love and they know that Jesus comes from God and we have this life and we are not condemned and it talks about us coming to the true light to to see that all of our deeds all of the things that we do are are based in God and what God is doing he does present the other side He does say there are people who don't believe. And not everyone does believe. And so those who don't believe, he said, well, they've condemned themselves. It isn't that God even pronounces a condemnation here. The simple fact is, well, you don't believe. And so there isn't a way. There is nothing given There is no other grace. There is no other love. There is no other relationship with that. And so if if you don't believe in Jesus and believe in the plan that God has and the way that he set this out, you're just self-condemned because you've refused to believe in in the things that God has. And then he gives what the people are like. He says there's no salvation for them there because there's no forgiveness for them there because... They've decided they will forgive themselves and they will depend on themselves. Judgment has come into the world, he says, because men like darkness. We don't want everybody to know our business. We don't want to know what's going on. We don't everyone want to see what's going on in our life. We, you know, there's too many people poking around anyway. And so how do you keep your life private? private from God because we don't want him messing in our life either then he would know our sin and we don't want people knowing our sin or our business or anything about us but then you also realize there's no help there's no one who loves you there's no one who cares for you there's no one who is able to do that and so they realize that they just don't want their life exposed because then people would know as if it's a secret? I mean, really? Can, can't you tell? But for some reason they think, well, oh, it's a secret. And so they run away from God because they don't want their life to be exposed. The believer does what's true. He goes to what's true. He wants people to see what he's doing. That his, his works come from God. That it's not just from himself. That he's doing things according to God. And he's not just trying to be able to save himself. So how do we respond to this love? Well, some gained eternal life because they listened and believed. And because they believed, they obeyed, and they did the things that Jesus wanted, and they did the commandments that Jesus gave, and they followed the example of who Jesus was, and 
they, they took into account all of those teachings of Jesus and says we will become his disciples because that was the first thing Jesus said is, you know, you follow me. And he had other disciples that taught the same thing, just follow Jesus. Well, does that mean there's requirements? Well, of course. It means you believe in God. It means there's other things that he said. You have to, well, do I have to be nice to anybody? Ah, on Tuesdays right? Well, no, it's the whole thing of everything Jesus was and did and commanded. Do that. And that's what he's describing here is being able to be in this great will of God. But, you know, sometimes we don't believe in God and we don't really want his grace and there's no repentance and there's no openness. And so we decide we'll be left to our own fate. It isn't that it takes God to condemn. It's the fact that we have refused to have any blessing from God whatsoever at all. Any grace, any forgiveness, any love, any kindness. And so that leaves us in a world that is completely empty. But at least nobody knows, right? That we have no grace and no faith and no love and no blessing. Yeah, I think they know. So how do we respond to this? Let me just give you a, a, a couple of stories and, and one passage today. So the first passage is what we call the greatest command. All right? When they came and they asked Jesus, what's the greatest command in all the law? Well, here's what he says. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the greatest command. The second one is love your neighbor as yourself. And those two are not the original Ten Commandments, but yes, they are in the commandments. And so we find those as him saying, that's kind of the summary. That's kind of the, the greatest command is to be able to love God and love other people. Well, that's tremendous. Can we do that? Well, sure, that's easy. It is really easy to love people that you don't see. Isn't it? Because you don't have to put up with them. They don't talk back. They don't argue with you. You don't have anything there. I mean, I can love God all, as long as he doesn't say anything. It's when people get together and when they start talking and when they disagree with us. How dare they? Well, God does talk. He's got a lot of things written. Some of those we may disagree with. But he says, here's the greatest, if you would love God. And understand who he is and understand what he says and know what all he's doing. It is a principle that a lot of laws are based on. But how does that work out practically? So how does this abundant love that God has for us work out into our life? And how would we respond to that great love? Well, we're going to love God. All right. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus tells a story or has an incident with Simon the Pharisee. He's invited to his house to eat. So he goes to Simon's house. It's a prestigious thing. Simon is one of the Pharisees, one of the rulers, one of the people that's really high up and uh, invites Jesus over. This is great. We're going to have a great, you know, power lunch and so the two guys get together, and they're ready to have this great power lunch as they get together. And uh, there's not much accommodation for Jesus. During that time, it was custom to kind of, you know, they wore sandals and they walked, and so their feet were dirty. And so they might wash their feet or have a slave wash their feet or something like that. But he doesn't really do that. He doesn't really take care of that. After all, I invited you to lunch. Let's go to lunch. And so they're there at the table. And as they're there at the table, this woman from the city comes in. That's what it describes her as, a woman from the city. Now, okay, we would not think of that as being something bad. But apparently that has some other connotations. A woman from the city, she carries a bottle of perfume or an alabaster flask. And these are very precious. The perfume in them is very precious, very expensive. 
And everyone knows this woman of the city because they all know about her sin. It's not just gossip. The gossip has gone rampant. Everybody in the city knows. How do they know? How do we know each other? Everybody knows. The whole city knows that she's a sinner. And she comes in and she begins to wet his feet with her tears and wipe the feet with her hair. And once the feet are clean, to anoint them with his perfume. And Simon, seeing all of this, you realize how they did back in those times. It wasn't like us. She's not under the table. Okay? You realize how that is? So if the table's right here, Jesus is actually like this. And so he's eating food here, so she is back behind him at his feet. Now that would still be a little bit disturbing, don't you think? To have somebody back behind you, what are you doing on my feet? I can hear you crying. <sighs> That's a little bit upsetting. And so just in this position, they're, they're trying to eat. I don't know how they stood it on their elbows, but this is the normal way of doing it. I guess they had cushions that propped them up. I forgot those today. But this would be how they did this. So if she's back there and she's the one going through all of this, Simon looks at this and says, if he was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. That she's a sinner. He wouldn't have anything to do with her. So he must not be a real prophet of God because no godly man would ever allow such a horrible sinner to come in and make such a spectacle over him. He knows her. He knows her shame. He knows all about it. The woman, on the other hand, continues to cry and take her tears on Jesus' dirty feet. So Jesus says, I have something to say to you, Simon. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one I suppose to whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much." But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And when those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So it begins with a story problem, right? Money lender, two debtors. One's 500, one's 50. He forgives them both. And then this is such an odd story problem. It's always like, you know, two cars, one's going 50 miles an hour, one's going 70 miles an hour at the other. They're going in opposite directions. And when they cross, what color is the dog on the corner? <laughs> you know, I'm just like, uh, I'm not sure. But which one will love him more is kind of one of those, what do you mean which one will love him more? He, he was forgiving and he says, well, I, I guess the one he forgave more. And he says, well, of course the one he forgave more. But he's talking to Simon, trying to figure out what Simon is. Simon sees her shame. Shame is the thing that hangs around long after forgiveness has already taken place. And Simon did nothing about her shame. Simon didn't try and take away her shame. Simon increases her shame by pointing out the fact that, 
Well, he wouldn't touch her if he really knew, because we all avoid people like that. And so Jesus turns and, do you see this woman? Well, that's kind of an obvious statement, isn't it? Obviously, he didn't see the woman. He saw what the woman represented. He never saw her. That she's a person who's repenting. She's a person who's sorry about her sin. She is in such grief over what has happened in her life and where she has allowed herself to be. And she doesn't know what to do, and she doesn't know how to get out of it. And so she takes it all out on Jesus' feet. And she brings the most precious thing that she's got, the most expensive thing, and she says, I'll just give him that. But she wouldn't dare interrupt the lunch, and so she comes and starts washing his feet because she loved much. How does he know she loved much? There's no conversation recorded where they discussed about this love. It's because she repented much. That's how he knows she loves much, is, well, look what she's doing. Look at how she handles her repentance. This is showing their love for God, because after all, she is, you know, doing this to my feet. She's showing that this man of God, this way of approach, because how do you find God anyway? For a woman in that day and time, would you go to the temple? You're not allowed. And she goes to the one guy that she knows has a connection with God, and she says, well, I believe you're the Son of God. Let me at least try to do something for you, for God. It's difficult, isn't it? How do we find God? Where in the world is God? Where would you go to God? And so she's kind of stuck in that place of going, well, I'll go to Jesus then, because I believe he's son of God, and that's where I'll make this connection, so I'll, I'll repent to him, I'll worship him, I'll bow before him. And she gives up all her dignity and all of her pretension and says, it does not matter. The main thing that I want you to realize is love repents. I know that's not one of the things we like to do today. It's not one of the obvious choices. When you love somebody, you send them a card. You might say, I love you, or you slug them on the arm, or you do something that's going to say, yeah, I kind of care about you. She repents with this incredible openness Because what she's doing is she's responding to the love of God. Those who have been forgiven much, loves much. So we're supposed to sin a lot more. No. You've already got enough. You don't need to be doing any more. But you need to repent of it. And that's the thing that is different for her. Those who have been forgiven much because they repented much. Sometimes we're not forgiven because we say, oh, well, hope he'll forget about it. I will. That's not love. That's not a connection to God. And so she does things for him. She humbles himself to the servant of God. Jesus says, your faith has saved you you can finally have peace. And she does. Your sins are forgiven. You're completely clean. He lifts her up. He's the one that sees her where Simon never did. Simon's probably still just amazed, going, well, I don't get it. I mean, why would he put up with this? Why is he talking to her anyway? I'm the one that gave him the lunch. Simon's just not understanding. Jesus did not come to shame sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. And yet that seems to be the concept a lot in church today, is that if I repent, then I'll have shame. Should not be that way. 
we are not there to hold shame either. We are not there to fill Simon's place and say, well, that's a sinner. Now we all know about that. No, we're there to take that place and be the one who's been forgiven. What an incredible place that is. And maybe the hardest part of all is you have to do it in front of Simon. With the guy watching who thinks you're a terrible, awful person. With the church watching who could be judgmental if they wanted to. And that's where she does it. She says, I don't care what anybody's going to think anymore. I just want some peace. And Jesus gives it to her. Well, that's abundant love. Because he loves her so much. She loves him so much. And you can see the exchange that takes place here. She loves him back. But there's one more story I wanted to share with you today. And this is the story at the end where Peter is... Uh, everything's done. I mean, they've been through this, and Jesus has already died on a cross, and, you know, here they are. It's going to be in John 21, and, and Peter finally says, well, I'm going back to fishing. What else are we going to do? It's been 40 days already, a month and some, and, you know, what else are we going to do? And they don't know what else to do because Jesus isn't there. They're not out doing miracles. They're not out preaching. They're not out teaching you know, he just, it's like there's nothing happening. Don't you hate that when there's nothing happening, nothing going on? And they don't know where to go next because there weren't further instructions given. And they're kind of lost and kind of confused. And the reason they're lost is because there's been no Pentecost. Right? They don't have a direction now. So they fished all night, and they caught nothing, and Jesus appears on the shore to ask, well, do you have any fish? Don't you hate that when you've been fishing and caught nothing? And cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And sure enough, they get a huge load of fish, 153 large fish, and they bring it in. And, you know, John says, Peter, that's the Lord. And he, he says, really? And he jumps out of the boat into the water, swims, you know, my picture is, you know, they're, they're pulling the boat in. There's Peter in the water. How you doing there, Peter? We could have used the help, but he's... No, he swims in and he goes up to Jesus because he wants to be there first. He's so excited to see Jesus, so excited to be there. And this is my Lord. And maybe there's some other direction. Maybe there's some other things he's going to tell us. And Jesus has already caught his own fish and already got breakfast fixed. And so they're able to eat breakfast, and after breakfast, he comes to Peter. And there's this conversation. When he had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. It's got to be very hard when somebody asks you the same thing three times and you're giving them the same answer three times and you get, well, are you asking me a different question? Didn't I answer that already? And it's like, well, I don't think you believe me. And that's probably true. Because do you love me is one of the hardest questions. Because the next one is what do you do about it? If you love me. And especially when you say that to God, do you love me? Then, okay, yeah, I love you up there, big guy in the sky. You know, you're fine. No, that's not it. That's not loving God. And Jesus here gives him specific. Do you love me more than these? These what? 
these fish? Yeah, that's been his life all the time. He's gotten all of his living from fishing and fish. And do you love me more than these? Well, yes, I love you more than my job, more than my business, more than these disciples. Yeah, I like you a lot better than them. Do you love me more than these? And then his answer is feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Three times. Jesus links love with taking care of other Christians. He did not say, go into all the world and solve world hunger. He didn't say, take care of all the people of the world. He said, feed my sheep. Mine, only mine. I'm not sending you to everybody. This is not a worldwide issue, a worldwide statement. But if you love me, then you feed my sheep. Remember what we talked about at the beginning? You know, some believe, and then there's those guys that don't. So the my sheep is going to be more the guys that believe. And the He didn't say go take care of everybody. He said, I want you to feed my sheep. And Peter is grieved and upset. Do you know why? Because there's been no Pentecost. And as soon as Pentecost happens, he knows exactly what he's supposed to do. He never has a question about that again. Feed my sheep? Absolutely. We've got 3,000 of them. And they're all sinful women. Well, no, not all. But there's a whole bunch of them who are all murderers. They stood there and they cried for Jesus to be crucified. Feed my sheep? Absolutely, God. I, I get it. I understand it. It's what needs to happen. Because this is the place where it's all come to. Sheep are everywhere and there's so much guilt for killing a Savior. There's so much time that they have wasted. There's so much hatred from the rulers and the Pharisees. There's so much lostness in these people that they don't know which way to go. And I got to balance it by love in that church. Feed my sheep. And it's incredible the way they took care of each other. Right? Not a needy person among them. Let's say there weren't needy people in Jerusalem. Not a needy person among them because it was very clear what the mission was. They pulled in together. This is who we are. This is where we t- take care of things. This is how we love God. Is by service in the place that Jesus told him to be able to love. See, the woman had to find Jesus and wash his feet. We have a much bigger place because we have all these people. And we know where his sheep are and we know exactly what it is. And so we are able to love God in an incredible way. And yet today it seems like we're lost and we don't know what to do. And we don't know what God wants and we get confused. I think there's two things that convict us with American Christianity. There are no tears in our repentance, and we have forgotten that there was a Pentecost. We don't know how to repent. We'd rather carry our own shame than have any real, genuine sorrow tears, and our repentance. And can't Pentecost define the place to love Jesus? It said, this is where you do it. This is the place. This is how. And you have this great example of the early church and how they took care of each other. And yet so much of what you see in the church now is people who are like, I don't need the church. I don't want the church. I don't even want to be part of that. I think we ought to do Let's, let's go do something else. Let's go feed homeless. Let's go feed other people. Let's not take care of ourselves. Let's go out and all these other things that we're doing. All those are fine. 
Habitat for humanity is great. Feeding starving children is great. But not at the expense of loving God in his church. And if we don't know how to do that, then we have lost the abundant love of God. And when people walk into a church, they go, I don't get it. I thought this was supposed to be a loving place. It is our focus. It is the question, do you love me more than all the rest of it? Then here is the place where you show it. And here are the people you show it to. It's incredible to look at what God has done with all of this. So when does love become abundant? When it loves past sin and hurt. And when it loves in the deepest need. Love acts. Love responds. Love helps. We may not be love forgiven much because we don't repent much. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be judged as a sinner. <laughs> really? You think you're hiding? <laughs> But it's when we get involved with other people, when we care about teaching kids or teaching adults or helping or caring, it goes from small to great. Remember, we learned that. Whatever you're doing now is small sacrifice, small way of serving God, and it's going to go to great. We talked about showing grace and about this is a great place where we show grace to each other, where we love like a family loves. Because when Jesus starts to define where do you love, this is it. Not that you don't love outside of this and go to other people also, but that isn't what he said. He said it all starts here. And yes, you have to do it in front of Simon. Because there's always going to be somebody grouchy and somebody's going to say, yeah, I know about you. Just say, you're right. <laughs> and I'm repenting. Jesus has... Abundant love. And he wants you to have that as well. So that's really your question today. When does love become abundant in your life? Has it been able to love you past all the sin and hurt? And able to fill some of your deepest need? Can we help with that? That's kind of what church is about, isn't it? So that we can pray for each other and help each other. Well, if we were able to help you at all, would you come while we stand and sing?